Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful hall. Obviously, uh, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the foresight of uh, Andrea and Barton and their uh, endowing this program that uh, is going to have 30 events, I understand, this coming week uh, throughout the campus. And it's very rare that people connect to a community college or a state university uh, in this manner and are very thankful. Uh, for their foresight. <clears throat> in thinking about what to say uh, this evening, I thought I would divide it into three parts. One, what are the aims of education? And two, what are the assets of uh, a university like Sonoma, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> the whole California State University system, 23 universities? And how can they be brought to bear on uh, social justice definitions, social justice goals, social justice priorities as part of the educational process. And then what, it, what, what does it take to break through power that is now so heavily concentrated economically and politically uh, and technologically in, in our country uh, as never before. And uh, as Justice Brandeis once put it, you can have concentration of great wealth, or you can have a democracy, but you can't have both. You cannot have both. And our description of de democracy, uh, justice has to be a consistent theme, and there's no such thing as a democracy. Uh, a democracy can be weak, mediocre, stronger, fragile, ephemeral, vulnerable, productive, innovative, all different grades. Uh, I don't have to say to you that I think our democracy has been in decline and in de deterioration for at least 40 years now on a whole scale of indicators, whether it's concentration of power, corruption of the electoral system with money, the exclusion of uh, alternative candidates uh, to be on the ballot, without which voters cannot have the full choice uh, that they deserve, uh, the increasing withdrawal of voters from even voting or informing themselves so they can have higher expectations and demands of their candidates, without which they get the candidates they deserve, don't they? Uh, we have a military industrial complex that would have frightened President Eisenhower, who coined that phrase and warned us about it. Over half of the federal government's entire discretionary budget, excluding Social Security and Medicare. Just think of this, over half goes to the military. Over half. And what is our major enemy? And we, there's no more Soviet Union. We're desperately looking for enemies to justify this kind of massive uh, support of a global empire with bases, personnel in over 100 countries, and history tells us all empires eventually destroy, devour themselves. And our empire has been devouring our country in terms of depleting critical funding and critical civilian technology for the public necessities of all our country people. And you can see it in the infrastructure, not just the crumbling infrastructure, but the lack of modernizing, upgrading it, and making it accessible democratically to people, holding it accountable uh, when it overreaches, as many of the new technologies are now uh, striving to do. <clears throat> I'd like to start with three little vignettes that I thought, especially for the students here. How many students are here? Okay, that's very good. A, uh, uh, the first one was Isaac Newton, uh, the famous physicist in England, uh, was at a social gathering. And uh, a person came up to him and said, Mr. Newton, why are you so much more brilliant than your other fellow scientists? And Newton said, I'm not so much more brilliant than other scientists, but perhaps I can hold on to a problem in my mind 
and concentrate on it longer than most. Concentration. The second little story is William Blake uh, in England, very famous literary figure, as many of you know. And he was at a gathering, and someone came up to him and said, Mr. Blake, with whom are you living these days? And Mr. Blake looked at the person and said, with whom am I living? I'm living with my imagination. Imagination. And the third was Einstein, who was reported to have said, uh, I have no special gifts. I only have a passionate curiosity. It's curiosity, imagination, and concentration. Now, <clears throat> that is, those are the rudiments of an educated mind. But they're not enough. You have to have a sense of justice, of fairness. You have to have normative values. Otherwise, they just turn into skills, which can be bought and paid for, for less than noble ends. But it is important that in a cell phone age, the word concentration gets more attention compared to all the text messaging. It's important that an educational system that starts with the first grade to stifle imagination of the students. Now you have teaching to the test, you have looking at screens, etc. And imagination and concentration. And the other one is curiosity. Now, Einstein once said curiosity is more important than knowledge. And what he meant by that was if you don't have curiosity, you don't search for knowledge the way Benjamin Franklin did. Uh, conce conceivably, our greatest American, certainly our greatest civic innovator, just think of what he accomplished. First volunteer fire department, the post office, uh, on and on. He just created these uh, civic institutions that bound the country uh, together. He even was a little more understanding of first Native Americans. And in those days, you know, uh, they were called savages. In fact, the Declaration of Independence refers to them as savages. Uh, the creator of the genocide were liberators, they weren't considered savages. Uh, it was a long time ago when uh, Senator Daniel Webster defined justice this way, the great work of human beings on earth. And isn't it interesting that it's often at the bottom rung of educational learning. Most of our professional schools don't deal with justice, whether they're architecture, law, medicine, engineering, Every profession has to confront the issues of justice and injustice. I remember when I was at law school, it was almost never mentioned. Considering justice issues was considered soft intellectually compared to the rigors of intellectual diagnosis and dissection of complex statutes and judicial decisions. In fact, I was told by in an eyewitness account in University of Chicago Law School that the celebrated federal judge uh, uh, who taught a course there, Richard Posner, you know, he's, he's written like 40 books in, it, in, in addition to being a full-time judge. He walked into the first day of class, turned to the blackboard, wrote the word justice in big letters. Then he turned to the students, the law students, he said, you see that word? I don't want to ever hear it again in my class. That was what the law and economics Chicago school was all about. They all measured things in terms of dollars, marginal economic utilities. Everything was measured in that manner. They didn't have to deal with philosophical issues of justice. They just had to deal with marginal economic utilities. It is interesting that just a few months ago, Justice Posner resigned and he said after all these years, he's finally come to the understanding and the recognition that there are millions of people in this country 
who don't have access to justice because they can't afford it. Well, well, well. <laughs> you see what the best and brightest are capable of. At least he admitted it. And he's going to devote the rest of his life toward reducing those obstacles. But you see, he had written all these books. He was such a subject of economic certitude. And he'd heard all of these cases. And finally, one or two of these cases by an indigent accused minority defendant got to him. And he changed. The question of can one person make a difference? We all know one person has made a difference. We know, we know a lot of one persons who've made a difference locally, neighborhood, state, regional, national, international. The question is whether 100 million people together can make a difference, a really big difference structurally in the way our society is organized. And, and if people say, I don't want to have an organized society, I'm a philosophical anarchist, my response is, keep arguing your case, but you can't have anarchism without local community neighborhood organization. But anarchism aside, it's either the people of this country who organize their society for themselves and their descendants, or it's corporations who are going to continue strategically planning our lives, which is what is happening now. Giant corporations now have no allegiance to any country. They transverse the globe, and they pick and choose where they're going to work or put their plants, and it has very little to do with allegiance to community, to people, or to nation. They will go where the money is, where they can easily pollute, where they can do what they, what they choose to do, where they can bribe governments more easily and exploit labor more severely. And when you look back and you say, you know, they really are strategically planning. That's what they do. They talk about strategic plan. They cannot stand unpredictability. They want certainty. Therefore, they have to control our governments because our governments are our main countervailing force. They have to weaken our unions because our unions are our countervailing force. They have to try to neutralize the media because the media is a potential watchdog accountable force. And these corporations are very good at, good at that. And they have something we don't have. They have a mono, maniacal standard of judgment, profit, maximum executive compensation. You don't see divisive debates inside ExxonMobil as to whether to go solar, geothermal, or just oil, gas, and coal. Most human beings have a versatility of values that conflict in, inside them. And that's why every major religion warned its adherents never to give too much power to the merchant class because they are so driven and motivated on the commercial value that they will triumph or trumpet or weaken or deplete anything in their way or co-opt anything in their way. It's a very cohesive, motivating principle maximizing sales, profits, getting rid of your competitors, and producing maximum compensation to the bosses. So when you look back on things that people have done for the common good, you, there's a lot of documentation that the fight is against corporate strategic planning of our food supply, corporate strategic planning of our elections, money, candidates, Koch brothers, corporate strategic planning of our government, swarming over Congress with thousands of lobbyists offering all kinds of inducements besides just campaign 
contributions. Strategic, corporate strategic planning of our system of contracts, fine print contracts that we sign on the dotted line or click on, not knowing what we are being held to because we can't read them. Sometimes we can't access them. If we could, we couldn't understand them. Corporate strategic planning of our right to trial by jury if we're wrongfully injured. They're trying to weaken the tort law system. It's called tort reform. We call it tort deform, which is one reason we started the first law museum of any kind in the world in Connecticut two years ago, called the American Museum of Tort Law, which is having visitors from all over the world because we still have the best tort system in the world. They're strategically planning our defense and military. Just think, Lockheed Martin, Grumman, Boeing, General Dynamics, Raytheon. They're pushing the Defense Department for weapons the Defense Department doesn't even want or need. They're swarming all over Congress, stifling public hearings so we don't get the truth that the anti-ballistic missile defense system, in which we've spent hundreds of billions of dollars since Ronald Reagan initiated it, doesn't work. It's the wrong kind of technology easily decoyed. We're not told how many public works are not being retrofitted and modernized in our bridges and highways and drinking water, sewage systems, schools, public buildings, national parks. An aircraft carrier today costs $13 billion. We have over 105 national parks, including Yosemite and Yellowstone. Do you know what the annual budget is for all of these national parks that have over 100 million Americans a year visiting them, foreigners visiting them? Just over $3 billion. $13 billion for another aircraft carrier. The only country that has more than one aircraft carrier is Italy. We have 13 or 14 of them. The Chinese are building the second one. An aircraft carrier in a missile technology world is anachronistic except for force projection by an empire. It can be blown up very easily and very quickly. Corporate strategic planning of our educational system. Commercialism winds its avaricious course through middle school, elementary school, high school, colleges. It is resisted by teachers and professors and deans and various degrees of stringency. But overall, they, they are triumphing. Corporate science, Monsanto style, not peer reviewed, politically driven, powerful in Washington, is way, way stronger than academic science, which is open, peer reviewed, and sometimes pleads for public interest missions. Commercialization of education uh, has affected our medical schools, has affected our engineering schools in terms of what's studied and what isn't studied. And one can go on, but the point is, isn't it time for us to plan our own future? Which is what democracy is all about. The idea that corporations can strategically plan keeping the minimum wage at an absurd $7.25 an hour federally with some states like California going a little bit higher, while executive pay is now at an all-time high of three to 400 times the average wage in the company. When I was a youngster, it was 13 times the CEO were paid uh, multiple over the average wage. And they weren't considered, you know, angels. They wanted money too, but nothing like what they're getting at the present time. One person can make a difference, we know that. I'll give you a few quick examples. 1988, California, the property casualty insurance industry was charging California motorists 
almost the highest auto insurance rates of any state in the country. I think there were three states higher. And so we put an initiative on the ballot, Harvey Rosenfield and I, he now is part of Consumer Watchdog in, in the LA area, we went all over the state, the insurance company spent $80 million smothering the TV with ads. We spent a couple million dollars, and at the end of election day, we beat them. And did they quit the state like they threatened? Absolutely not. It's too lucrative a market, California. Instead, they're still making money, but now California has one of the lowest auto insurance rates of the 50 states. It has a pretty good insurance commissioner compared to the others, because the insurance commissioner is elected, not appointed as it was. And J. Robert Hunter, the most honest property casualty actuary in the country, former federal insurance administrator under Gerald Ford and Jimmy Counter Carter, estimates that California motorists have saved over $100 billion, billion dollars a year excuse me, since 1989, 100, over $100 billion. Two people, getting more people, getting the LA Times to write about it, going up and down, arguing the insurance industry. Two people didn't pull it all off, but without those two people, the other people wouldn't have been organized in the same mission. And we see this again and again. I was interviewing a PhD uh, candidate at MIT back in the early 70s, uh, Michael Jacobson. And uh, I said, uh, what are you interested in? He said, science for the people. That was the phrase then. I said, okay, why don't you come to Washington, but are, are you a long timer uh, or you just wanna dress up your resume? He said, I'm a long timer. He's still at it. He started the Center for Science and the Public Interest, and he and his 30 people on staff have revolutionized nutrition availability in our supermarkets. And millions of people have improved their nutrition, with many millions more needed to, because of his efforts going on television, Phil Donahue's show, he's got a million circulation newspaper, Nutrition Action, just a handful of people took on the giant food processing industry, and they're still at it. Sidney Wolf, who's a young doctor over at National Institutes of Health, what do you want to do, Sid? I want to monitor the drug industry, he tells me. This is in the early 70s. So we started the health research group. He has taken off the market hundreds of dangerous medicines or medicines that don't produce what they're advertised to produce. That is, they don't work. And he's put out books called Worst Pills, Best Pills. Some of you may subscribe to his dirt cheap uh, it, uh, website where you can get 24 hours a day uh, whether the, the, the prescription that you were given by your doctor uh, was a worst pill or a best pill. Whether it should have been another drug that has fewer side effects even though both drugs are approved by the Food and Drug Administration. He has about seven people taking on the giant pharmaceutical industry. And, and they're, all, they're all waiting for, to trip him up so they can blast him on national TV. You don't trip him up on inaccuracies. He's too, he's too, uh, too rigorous. And what did he have? What did all these people have? What did Robert Falmouth have, who runs the Citizen Advocacy Center, University of San Diego Law School? He's got more bills through protecting children in Sacramento than almost everyone else combined. And he's a watchdog for children here in California. And he has a little advocacy group. I think its budget is about 400,000 a year. 400,000 a year? That's a few days work for some of these CEOs. And look at the effect he has had. Karen Ferguson came to us. She wanted to work on pensions, trillion dollars worth of pensions, public pensions, private pensions. Nobody was watchdogging 
Nobody was standing up for workers uh, in Congress. And she's still at it. Pension Rights Center. What did they have that made him successful? Here's what they had. They had a higher estimate of their own significance in life. That's what they had. That was the first step. They weren't going to be trivialized. They went through some of the best schools and all that, and they weren't going to sell their skills uh, to the highest corporate bidder uh, because it was lucrative. They wanted to look at themselves in the mirror and not blush. So they had a higher estimate of their own significance for advancing social justice. The second thing they had was competence and knowledge. They knew what they were talking about. The third thing they had was they were proposing changes that were supported by the great majority of the American people. They had public opinion behind them, like Michael Jacobson on food or Robert Felmuth on children. And the final thing they had, they knew where the decision had to be made. They weren't just interested in marches and demonstrations on weekends when Congress was away with all the energy going into the ether. They built support and zeroed in on the lawmakers, Sacramento or Washington. A handful of them, right? 535 of them in Washington. They put their shoes on every day like you and I. And they have enormous amount of your power that you've given them under the Constitution, which starts not with we the Congress, but we the people. That's where the sovereign power is. Why do we keep giving them all this power that they sell to Wall Street and other corporate donors and then turn our power that we've given them against us? That's an interesting question you can ask your neighbors and friends because they sort of give you a blank look. Why do you give them all this power? You delegate this power to them. That's the Republican form of government. But why don't you hold the reins? Why don't you summon them to your town meetings, to your agenda back home in every congressional district and every state? Well, the answer is, well, you know, we're very polarized, our country, red state, blue state, liberal, conservative, right wing, left wing, we're very polarized and divided. Really? Why do we keep being told that? Well, in some areas we are divided. You know, gun control, although the majority want it, reasonable gun safety laws, abortion, school prayer, uh, phantom uh, view of overregulation. They never get specific when they say overregulation. But by and large, we are on the same page, regardless of liberal conservative, on many of the major redirections in our country. You know how many people are opposing Iraq and the Afghan war? Huge proportions. But they're stifled because you've got to support the troops. That's the technique that's used. The minute they send the US soldiers over there on criminal wars of aggression that are not declared by the US Congress and therefore not constitutional, they shut everybody up, or just almost everybody up. The other point is, just think of the areas where you come in 70, 80% in the polls, higher minimum wage. There are places now, there's a majority of people for 15 bucks an hour, never mind 80% for 12 bucks an hour, federal. Cracking down on corporate crime. The crooks, the big crooks get off. Not a single Wall Street crook was prosecuted and sent to jail in the 2008-9 collapse with eight million jobs lost, trillions of dollars shaved off people's pensions and lifetime savings. And then they have the gall to go to Washington and get bailed off on the backs of the taxpayer. 90% of the people want the big New York banks that are deemed too big to fail to be busted up. Criminal justice reform bloated military budget. You had Ron Paul and a very liberal member of Congress, Barney Frank, in a, uh, a caucus to cut back on the bloated military budget. If area after area that is not in the media, and they were not told, bring red state, blue state, 
liberal conservative together. Conservative families do not want their children to breathe dirty air, drink contaminated water, or eat unsafe food, or take unsafe medicines. They don't say, because we're against regulation, okay, kiddies, go to it. Die, get sick. It's nonsense. When you come down the abstract ladder of ideology, where people live, work, and raise their children. They come together on the same page. They bleed the same way in the South as they do in the North when the insurance companies deny benefits and deny coverage. They bleed the same way when they're breathing toxic pollution. In Flint, Michigan, they bled the same way with lead in water. Whether they're conservative or liberal, it didn't matter. Divide and rule for 2,000 years has been the practice of the oligarchs and the plutocrats. We know that. We should not be vulnerable to it, and we should resist it rather than say, yeah, we're so divided, I never have any friends who are conservatives because I can't stand their support of Trump. Bring it down to where people live, and you see a difference. You see that in West Virginia, which is a heavily Republican state, but when they don't want that pipeline to go through, doesn't matter how many Republican senators and legislators in Charleston are with the, drug, with the pipeline companies. And the same is true in so many issues around the country. Now, the, the mantra we go by here is readers think and thinkers read. And I say this to the students. You have to read more. And looking at screens doesn't quite fill the bill. Because if you like what you hear here, it's only the tip of the iceberg of the amount of material that people have brought together in this country, documenting injustices and advancing common sense solutions, none of which are perfect. They always have to be refined and uh, updated uh, to so many of the problems, some of which I mentioned. Uh, take health care, for example. Most people who want a full Medicare for all, free choice of doctor and hospital, it comes in at half the price per capita with better outcomes. That's the situation in Canada. Public funding, private delivery of health care in Canada. Uh, they look like us there, too, by the way. <laughs> Why don't we ever learn from Canada? They taught us credit unions. They brought credit unions to America from Quebec over 100 years ago. We've gotten a lot of good things from Canada. But Canada is a no-no in Washington. It's too successful in areas that we don't want the people here to avail themselves of. But it's interesting that in arguing for full Medicare, two arguments are almost never made. One is, that in Luxembourg, Taiwan, Japan, Germany, Italy, France, Norway, Canada, nobody dies. Nobody dies because they cannot afford health insurance to get diagnosed and treated in time because they're insured from the moment they're born. In the, in the, US, in the U.S., home of the free and the brave, land of the brave, Home of the brave, land of the free. 35,000 people die. That's 700 a week. Who says so? Whenever tell, someone gives you a fact, who says so? Something Washington reporters have yet to learn. Who says so? It's a peer-reviewed study out of Harvard Medical School by doctors Himmelstein and Wallander. When they did the study, it was before Obamacare put another 20 million under health insurance. So they had a figure of about 45,000. Americans die every year. It's a pay or die. Now that some of these drug prices, $1,000 a pill, $100,000 for a year, it's pay or die. And these drug companies are developing a lot of these drugs with your tax dollars, corporate welfare. And they keep the profits. And there's no reasonable price provision. And no country in the world doesn't control drug prices except one country, the country that subsidizes them and the country that gave birth to many of these big drug companies and protects them with tax breaks 
We're the only country that doesn't control drug prices. Pay or die. Anytime you hear anybody say, you know, the American people, they're tough. You know what you should say? Nuts. <laughs> they're patsies. They see their relatives dying because they can't afford health insurance, because they can't afford drug prices, because they're facing a $300,000 operation. We're tough? What do you mean being tough? We grew up being told we're number one in the world. We're full of arrogance and hubris. Now we can't even claim that in wages. We're about 25th in the world. We're the world's leading debtor. We were the world's leading creditor in 1980. We're about 28th in infant mortality. There are third world countries that have a better, lower infant mortality. And on and on. And yet, we talk about American exceptionalism. It's a controlling process by the ruling powers. We know how it works. Why do so many people swallow it? Because we're not doing our homework. When I was running for president, I was the only one who was criticizing voters. That's considered not good politics. <laughs> I would go around saying, have you ever met a politician? who criticizes voters? I said, if you think so, I'll show you a visiting Martian. Politicians flatter voters, fool voters, flummox voters, confuse voters, lie to voters. You should never allow them to do that. You should be so informed that you summon them to your town meetings and you put them on the stage and have them answer your questions with the local media. And you tell them it's we the people. And you'll see the dynamic of the balance of power move from the Congress and the state legislature to you. How many? Most social justice movements throughout American history have never involved more than 1% of active citizens representing majority opinion with knowledgeable information. You know, you heard about Occupy Wall Street, the 1% of the rich. I was talking about the 1% needed to turn this country around. What am I talking about? The average congressional district is 700,000 people. 1%, 7,000 people. Let's be more modest. Let's say one half of 1%, 3,500 people. Every congressional district has colleges, universities, or community colleges. They have skilled technicians, engineers, scientists, lawyers. They have smart mechanics and plumbers and electricians. And it's pretty well distributed. 3,500 people devoting a hobby level amount of time, that's three to 500 hours a year, and a hobby level amount of money, that's three to 500 bucks a year people spend on hobbies, minimum. And they form congressional watchdog groups and they put before the Congress 10 long overdue changes, living wage, you know, the easy stuff. It's long overdue compared to other countries too, full Medicare and so on. And they say, you're coming to us and we're going to give you time to bone up on these issues so don't give us glass eye stares and smiles when you hear our demands. And we're going to send you back to Congress and we want action in so much time. Otherwise, you're not coming back because we represent majority opinion. Now, do you know how many bird watches there are in our country? We have 15 million bird watches, about 3 million serious ones, you know, up at dawn into the marshes, binoculars, <laughs> pictures taken. Do you know how many full time Congress watches we have? Probably 1,000. And part time, very few. So that's why we're in trouble. Because in major area after area that you think is unjust, you think is unjust in this country. Ask yourself how many full-time people in the citizen arena 
are working to turn it around. How many full-time people you think are now working as in the citizen arena to get full Medicare for all? My best guess is there aren't 100. 100? You got 500 drug company lobbyists just working on Congress. So we need 1% or less. We defeated the auto industry with a fraction of 1% around the country in 1965, 66. And many of our victories have been a fraction of 1%, a congressional hobby. You know, like you see, you go around, you meet people. Hi, how are you? Good, even though you're sick. You go around, you say, hi, how are you? Good. How's your civic life? See, the, see how they look at you. What do you mean? Hi, how's your civic life? How much time do you put on your civic responsibilities? You know, if you don't put any time, the rascals are going to run away with our country. And that's what it comes down to. Time, talent, commitment, and people who make it a hobby. Some people collect stamps. They collect coins. They watch birds, healthy hobby. How about a fraction of the people watching our governments and making sure they're not taken over by big business and turned into what right-wingers call crony capitalism, and what liberal progressives call corporate welfare, and what political scientists call the deadly corporate state, the merger of big business with big government serving big business. Whenever you hear people say there's not enough money for educational budgets, there's not enough money for clean drinking water systems, there's not enough money for daycare, there's not enough money for neonatal care, uh, there's, there's not enough money for keeping up our parks, not enough money for the arts. We're burning money like there's no tomorrow when it comes to the plutocrats. In the last 10 years, Corporations' profits, that's your dollars, right? Five trillion dollars of corporate profits have gone to buy back their own stock. That's like burning money, doesn't create any jobs, doesn't increase any research and development, doesn't increase worker salaries, doesn't shore up pension funds. What it does is temporarily improve the stock price, which is a criteria for the compensation packages of the bosses. Now let that sink in, please, because it took me a while for it to sink in. Five trillion dollars burnt in a rising stock market in order to get their stock options and their pay higher than it is even now for the few at the top. In other words, they're mismanaging their own company because they don't have anything better to do with that money, like lifting Walmart worker wages, than to buy back their stock to raise their compensation. This year, because of the Trump tax cut for the wealthy, the estimate is they're going to buy back $700 billion in one year. Think of what that money could do. These are mismanaged corporations. Not by my judgment. I talk to people in the corporate world and I say, how do you judge management? And they say, the number one way I judge management is executive compensation and stock buyback, which means that they don't have productive uses for their corporate for profitable surplus other than to enrich themselves. <clears throat> now, I know young people uh, are looking ahead 50 years, 60 years. The question is, where do they want to look back? What do they want to look back on when they're 70 or 80 years old? They ought to ask that question. Then they might make different choices when they get out of college or 10 years out of college or whatever. <clears throat> and let me suggest that the time to think about those choices are right now when you're at the university. Because 
If you learn by doing, if you practice what you preaching, like on environment issues, you retain those values as a way of daily life rather than just believing it, but somehow not doing it. Alfred North Whitehead wrote a book in the 1920s. He's a famous British philosopher and scientist uh, called Aims of Education. Just a little paperback. Suggest you read it. Ton of wisdom. And he doesn't talk about education in vocational terms only. He talks about it in terms of developing the kind of thinking that will lead to a public philosophy of life and living. And so let me just give you about 10 examples of how here at Sonoma State University you can do what I've just suggested and have a major impact here in California, if not as an example around the United States. You all have uh, a newspaper, you have a college newspaper, you have a college radio station, maybe you have a college TV cable, I don't know. And you have gathering places like this hall. And you have experts called faculty that you can draw on. When again in your life are you going to have those? When again in your life are you going to have your own radio station, your own newspaper, your own experts, your own gathering places? Are you making the most of it? My perusal of college and university newspapers is they're bad replicas of yellow journalism. They're trivial, they're sports, they're gossip, they don't really produce enough serious content. And that's a shame. The radio stations are overwhelmingly music. And that's a shame. That's what develops community. And you can still turn it around. And turn it around to do what? Well, Sonoma State has physics labs, chemistry labs, biological labs. Am I right? Yes. OK. You know what you study there, and it's worthwhile. But look what else you could do. You could test local drinking water every semester and see if it conforms with national drinking water standards, such as heavy metal testing, cadmium, arsenic, lead. There's a community college in Flint that was doing that. They would have caught the lead much earlier than the corrupt government and General Motors, which knew about it early because its workers were refusing to drink this colored water, and they bought them bottled water and didn't tell Flint people that their water was contaminated. You can do a lot of things in physics lab. You can test soils. And in the process, you learn by doing. You learn about the Drinking Water Safety Act of 1974. How do you use it? What, what rights do you have to the regular testing, full rights to the regular testing? So you learn how to be a citizen, and you learn a different kind of physics and chemistry. Political science, how about a course called Congress 101, where every semester you study a member of Congress that represents you in terms of their dynamic behavior, or lack thereof, their voting records, their floor votes, their committee votes, their attendance records, what issues they put forward, how energetic they are in connecting with the people back home, who they take money from, and so on. And you put it up on the web for all the citizens to evaluate the incumbents. Are you learning government? Yes. Are you getting the attention of your two representatives or two senators and representatives? You betcha. They will immediately start respecting you because you're going to show them the power of knowledge that is timely, accurate, and able to be disseminated. Procurement. University buys things. What if 23 California state universities decided that they were going to up their buying criteria 
for eco ecological advances. They already do that. You have recycling. We never had recycling when I was at university. So there's been a lot of progress in that area, a lot of awareness by students. But there's still a lot to go. So what if you, for example, um, what if you want to get, what if you want to help preserve part of the Amazon and buy highly nutritious, non-pesticide infected fruit pulp and juice from palm trees and other species in the Amazon, which are some of the most commonly uh, common trees in the Amazon. And you know that the people who are doing that are not cutting down the trees for the, tru for the fruit, but they are scaling the trees and bringing the fruit down for a renewable food source and food security. And what if you provided a market for that? What if you were told that this fruit uh, was greatly nutritious, had 30 times the vitamin C of organic orange juice? And what if you bought it? You would be improving nutrition, and you would be helping to save part of the Amazon, and you'd be providing a livelihood to the indigenous people who are climbing those trees and harvesting the fruit without cutting the trees down. How many people would be interested in that? I mean, that's just one of hundreds of examples of how you can turn procurement around. The person who's engaged in that is right here in the audience. Where are you? Where are you? Tarp? I guess he stepped out. OK. Anyhow, that's just an example of what the buying power uh, can uh, produce. Civic skill courses. Do you have a civic skill course here? If you don't, it's very easy to set it up. I'm sure a lot of teachers would love to teach it. Someone asked you, uh, uh, can you write a thousand word essay on your social skills, your academic skills, and your civic skills? You probably could do the first two. Could you do the third? What are the civic skills other than voting in an informed way? Well, learning how to use the Free Information Act. How about that? Information is a currency democracy. You have a state and federal information, Free Information Act, getting files from the governments that they don't normally want to uh, divulge. You learn how to build coalitions. You learn how to give other people credit. You learn how to be resilient from discouragement and uh, being uh, disillusioned. Uh, you learn how to scour City Hall, and uh, you learn how to do all kinds of things. And if we don't have civic citizen skills, what are we going to do with our computer skills? We're going to work for Silicon Valley. We're going to work for corporations without citizen skills, which is why Silicon Valley is increasingly under a massive barrage of criticism because of the unintended effects of the use of these technologies. And there's more to come like virtual reality goggles, et cetera. The, uh, the, uh, the possibilities are endless, endless. Mickey Huff, where are you, Mickey? Mickey, Mickey Huff is there, and he's reminded me that you have the California state system that could create a major citizen action group working in San Francisco and, excuse me, Sacramento and Washington, D.C. Uh, the uh, Cal, uh, California system, UC Berkeley, uh, and uh, uh, Santa Cruz, et cetera. They have their own citizen group, you know. They canvass, they litigate, they lobby. It's called CalPERG. How many people have heard of CalPERG? Okay. Um, and you can have the one at the California state level, and there are over 100 community colleges in the state, and they can have one too. You think educational interests will be ignored when you have full-time people in Sacramento backed by organized students who've got tremendous energy, idealism, commitment, and arguments? You think you'd be pushed around where the prison budget in California is bigger than the entire higher education budget of the state of California? With all kinds of people in prison for nonviolent transgressions, like having a, a few weeds? <laughs> huh? That's, that'll be gone pretty soon, but you still have other powder 
Can you imagine that? More money is spent on the prison system? And what would it take? It would take a check off on your tuition bill, where you assess yourself six, seven bucks a year. You put it in a nonprofit group. You elect your fellow students, the board of directors. They hire the 25, 30, 40 year olds, uh, lawyers, economists, auditors, publicists, publicists, and you go to work. Piece of cake. Whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So when I wrote this little book, which is going to be available after the session, called Breaking Through Power, It's Easier Than We Think, people would come up to me and say, look, let's not give people an excessive sense of optimism. You know how hard it is to change things in this country. Yeah, I do, when there's nobody trying to change them full time. When nobody part-time has anybody full-time to ally themselves with, working on the lawmakers. You know, nobody's pushing a rock that's blocking traffic. What are you going to say? The rock is immovable? You say enough of people out of their cars getting the boulder out of the way. Finally, the, the uh, the tools, the assets you have at this university goes right to the kind of food you eat in your cafeteria, what you allow these companies to put in your vending machines. Some universities around the country sign exclusive agreements with Pepsi-Cola and Coca-Cola. Um, that's not the way to run a, a university. You want nutritious, delicious food in those vending machines. Uh, fortunately, more people now are drinking water than drinking soft drinks, which is a remarkably unpredicted phenomena a number of years ago. In the 60s, soft drinks overcame milk, and then they overcame water in terms of volume. Now, soft drinks are declining because people are finding out what's in them, and the bottled water industry is ascending. And, and, uh, it's very important that you decide what kind of food and drink they're uh, operating here. Uh, all these are just examples. You can come up with plenty of others. The point is, you've got to have a civic spirit, a civic motivation. You've got to change your priorities in ways that will advance your own personal interests in life and your own community interests and what you aspire to. Otherwise, these giant corporations are going to be strategically planning your genetic engineering. They're going to be strategically planning everything, your privacy, your invasion of privacy. And they will be planning it on the basis of commercial profit criteria, which leaves out the great humane values and civic values of our history and our aspirations. Now, Mickey puts together with the fr friends this Project Censored. How many have heard of Project Censored? The students all over the country have an input in this. But you don't hear much about it on NPR and PBS because we're not demanding the NPR and PBS and the commercial stations who use our public airwaves. We're not demanding that they put on important subjects and important people. And so you look at the media, you listen to the media, you can get pretty depressed, right? You have all the junk on Saturday afternoon, ABC, NBC, CBS, you know, the bicycles flipping over and grade C movie reruns and uh, uh, household appliance, you know, knives and cutters, you know, they're selling you. You begin to say, is this all that's going on in the USA? On our property, the public airways? Why are we giving them away free through the FCC? to these corporations. And so the bottom line is to rupture our growing up corporate and begin growing up civic, thinking for ourselves, demanding evidence, using the kind of information that will better everybody's lives. And you can measure whether you grow up corporate in a lot of ways. Two quick ones are this. If I say the following words to you, what comes to mind? Here we go. Crime, violence, 
regulation, welfare, street crime, rapes, violence, war, regulation, government, welfare, people lined up for their monthly checks, poor people. What if I told you you were accurate, but not quantitatively anywhere near the level of corporate crime, corporate violence, corporate regulation of our lives, and corporate welfare bailouts, Wall Street style, on the backs of taxpayers. There's no comparison, quantitatively. And I'll run you through a whole string of documented statistics. 250,000 people die in the US due to preventable problems in hospitals. That's 5,000 a week. Who says so? A study by the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine authored by physicians. And they said that was the rock bottom estimate. 60,000 people a year die from workplace-related diseases and trauma. OSHA figures, preventable. I mentioned 35,000 because they don't, can't afford health insurance. $350 billion a year this year will be cheated on computerized billing fraud and abuse in the healthcare industry. 10% of everything we spend is stolen including $60 billion of fraud on Medicare by criminal vendors. Who says so? The leading specialist, Malcolm Sparrow, at Harvard, Law, at Harvard University, applied mathematician, backed up by the General Accounting Office study of 1992. You see the scale of corporate crime and preventable violence? 65,000 people a year die from excruciating diseases coming from air pollution, preventable. Who says so? The Environmental Protection Agency. It's over 1,000 a week. How many homicides are there on the streets of America? It's about 14,000 by comparison. All terrible. Corporate welfare compared to poverty welfare? doesn't match up. The multi-trillion dollar bailout of Wall Street alone stands like a towering presence of crony capitalism and corporations on the take for their criminal negligence and speculation with the dollars of pension plans and mutual funds. Regulation? When, when was the last time you dared to change the fine print on your insurance policy, your mortgage, your credit card application, and your bank registration card, or your installment loan from your auto dealer. They have destroyed our freedom of contract. It's take it or leave it. And they're all the same fine print, whether it's MasterCard, Visa, Ford, GM, Prudential, Metropolitan Life. Same fine print, one-sided. They tell you that you have to be charged penalties, overcharges, late fees. They can do anything they want because they said you've agreed to it in the fine print. We've lost our freedom of contract. You want to talk about regulation of people's lives underneath almost all our relationships in the marketplace is a one-sided fine print contract that is enforced by the power, the police power of our country. They can take away your house, they can do all kinds of things. They can ruin your credit because you've signed that fine print contract and you haven't been able to read it. You couldn't understand it. You really didn't consent. Have any of you ever had a bounce check and paid 35 bucks? Okay. Did you ever ask yourself whether you agreed to that? Did you ever agree to that? You never even think of it, right? That's how deep it is growing up corporate. Our forefathers fought for the freedom of contract and the freedom to go to court and have a trial by jury in open court if you're defrauded or wrongfully injured. And we're losing them because we're not awake. We're asleep at the switch. 
Once you lose those two pillars of private law that we can actuate, we don't have to beg government or anyone to use. We've lost our freedom in the most fundamental sense. So I ask you, if any of you are interested in dealing with this contract situation, why don't we try an American Express contract or a Bank of America contract or Verizon contract, horrendous fine print, and we throw it open to open source revision and see how many people in this country who know a little bit about these subjects will produce an open source consumer respectful contract in order to get the, the ball underway for reform. And why can't business courses at universities have that as one of their exercises in understanding the marketplace? Okay, I'm going to end on, on this note. Those of you who want uh, more information here on social justice, I have a weekly column that I hammer out on my Underwood typewriter. <laughs> And you can get it free. Just go to nader.org, sign, you'll get it free. It's, it's not anything you usually read. It's pretty well documented. And it's seven minutes of agitation a week, so it doesn't take long. I also put guests on who are experts in their field on very important subjects, but never get on NPR, PBS, TV, commercial. Uh, and have a ralphnaderradiohour.org. You can download it on your podcast, and it's on KPFA in Berkeley, et cetera. What we need to do is simply ask ourselves, how much time and how much of our talent are we going to put on practicing democracy in the search for social justice? And there's no better place to start than when you're in school, instructed by faculty, who would love to have you aspire to a higher sense of significance in the coming years of your life. Thank you very much.